Hi, this is uh, Matthew Robert Payne, and this is uh, the second uh, part of uh, my uh, new book uh, called God Encounters. Uh, this is the first story. Uh, I had a friend who uh, prophesied that I was going to have a spiritual promotion and uh, there was going to be uh, a number of angels that uh, were allotted to me. Uh, he said uh, in his prophecy that I would know the name of the head angel. Um, and uh, I'd been uh, having encounters uh, with <clears throat> a group of uh, 2,000 angels um, who each had 3,000 angels that they were in charge of, I was told. So the total amount of angels was 6 million. And uh, they first came to my house one time. Well, I'd seen them other times uh, lining across the road uh, and visiting me and waving at me. Um, but one time they came to my house and um, they were waiting to be dispatched. The Holy Spirit uh, told me that I had to send them on an assignment, and I sent them, I sent them on an assignment into the states to uh, minister to sexual abuse uh, victims uh, and uh, go into the dreams of sexual abuse victims. So I dealt with angels before, and. When uh, he said that um, I was going to get a promotion with angels, um, uh, I uh, understood uh, what the angelic was. Uh, I came outside uh, from my house and was going to go to the shopping centre. Uh, I walked to the bus stop. As I walked to the bus stop, the 2,000 angels uh, were outside my house um, that I'd seen before. And uh, when I got to the bus stop, I noticed the presence of an angel. And I said, uh, you're the head in charge of the angels. He said, yeah. I said, what's your name? He said, Jonathan. And uh, I said, Jonathan, can I test uh, something to see if you're really in charge of these 2,000 angels? He said, sure. And uh, I said, <clears throat> there's an election uh, in three days' time in Australia. Can you send each of uh, the angels into uh, people's dreams and have uh, the people uh, dream that uh, the angel appearing in their dream uh, is a friend of theirs uh, telling them uh, why they should uh, vote conservative uh, in <coughs> in the upcoming election. Um, for, for conservative voters, uh, have them uh, reassure uh, the person in the dream why they actually vote conservative and have them vote conservative. But for um, the liberal uh, sort of voters, uh, have the angel uh, give uh, reasons why um, the person should vote uh, conservative this time and not liberal. Um, and uh, so have each of the angels appear uh, in the dreams uh, looking like one of uh, the dreamer's friends and uh, having a conversation with them uh, saying why uh, they should uh, uh, vote uh, in the conservative manner. Um, and uh, the angel uh, took the message and uh, uh, it wasn't, the election was on Saturday, it was uh, Sunday afternoon. I was at this cafe, I was watching the news and uh, and the news was reporting that uh, there'd been a 3% swing uh, to the Conservative uh, Party in Australia 
and uh, it was a Trump-like win. Uh, it was a miracle. Um, they had the word uh, miracle uh, election um, and Trump-like win and uh, Trump-like miracle um, in uh, the newspapers. Um, and uh, they were saying it was an astounding victory for the Conservative Party. And um, the reason I wanted... <coughs> The Conservative Party is they'd promised uh, to build uh, stadiums uh, in Australia uh, and I know that uh, we needed uh, stadiums for upcoming revivals in the future of Australia. So uh, I vote Conservative normally, uh, but uh, I wanted them in, especially because of that election promise. Um, and so um, they went to work and uh, worked in people's dreams and uh, did that miracle. Um, it was a miracle. Uh, uh, you don't have a swing like that unless you've had a miracle. And uh, uh, that was uh, one of my first identifiable uh, abilities to uh, direct angels and, uh, and uh, discharge angels into a job um and uh yeah so that was uh my first story um one time uh this uh, same prophet prophesied uh that i was going to have a really large supernatural encounter one that I hadn't had uh, before, one that would eclipse everything I've had before. And uh, that was a little bit too much for me to handle, so I just put it on the shelf and uh, said uh, that'll happen <clears throat> whenever it uh, due to happen. And uh, I was lying on uh, my couch uh, talking to a friend on Facebook phone and we used to speak for hours and uh, I was lying on my couch and Satan appeared in my house and uh, he appeared uh, at the end of the room and I said to my friend that Satan had just appeared and uh, she said get Michael to chuck him out of your house and uh, I said no he's okay for now he's listening and he's not doing me any harm. And uh, Satan was uh, handsome and uh, he looked young and uh, he looked like uh, females would desire him. Um, and uh, I've heard before that Satan is handsome and uh, he is handsome uh, from what I saw. Uh, I was talking to my friend and my friend was concerned about Satan being there. And um, then Mary Magdalene turned up and uh, she uh, she uh, put her arm around Satan and said, how are you charming? Well, as soon as she put her arm around him, uh, he disappeared. Uh, the anointing and the power in Mary Magdalene must have drove him away. It must have been too much for him. Um, I'd often um, had a doubt over a woman, uh, whether she had a wrong spirit. And I used to put my arm around them to test how they reacted uh, to that. So um, people can have a bad reaction uh, from having your arm around them, uh, besides just the male having their arm around a single girl. Um, uh, it can have a bad reaction when it's spiritual. So that's what uh, happened. Uh, with uh, Mary Magdalene. Uh, soon uh, other guests uh, from heaven started to turn up in my house. Um, Enoch and Elijah turned up. Uh, Jesus turned up. Uh, the Father uh, came and had a visit. Um, different saints from heaven turned up and then a whole lot of people uh, from heaven uh, were in the sky um, and it was uh, the, by large by all accounts, the largest encounter I've ever had, uh, millions of saints uh, came outside my house and uh, it felt me 
I, I felt uh, really glorious uh, uh, because of it. Um, and I was uh, very much encouraged uh, by what Enoch and Elijah had to say. And Enoch and Elijah are going to be used as the Revelation 11, uh, two witnesses, the two uh, prophets that are going to come to the earth uh, before uh, Jesus comes back. Um, so, um, so uh, that's uh, the end of the story. Um, I uh, was in entertaining uh, this next story. Uh, uh, as entertaining uh, the coven of witches, um, and uh, they got to a stage where they were driving me insane, uh, keeping me up all night and all day, and uh, talking to me. And uh, started uh, they started to harass me. Um, <clears throat> I had one of I I hit my mobile phone. Because I didn't want uh, them messaging it and uh, and uh, making it uh, go on and off, and uh, I hid it in my uh, pants. And um, one of the witches said, "We know you've hidden your mobile phone on your in your pants. Uh, put it out on uh, your mantelpiece, and uh, and leave it there and turn it off." So I turned it off. And put it on my mantelpiece so it wouldn't disturb me. And uh, as soon as uh, I went back uh, to lie down, uh, the mobile phone, uh, the cell phone, uh, powered up and uh, started to ring. And uh, that was enough for me. I uh, I uh, didn't answer the phone, and then I rang the ambulance and. Uh, had uh, the ambulance admit me to a psychiatric ward. Um, I was uh, getting driven crazy. And uh, I I soon uh, was getting uh, kept up all night uh, by uh, the witches uh, talking to me. Um, but uh, I talked to one of the night nurses and he said he could give me some medication uh, to stop the voices and... Uh, well, he had a medication uh, that he believed would work for me, for me to get some sleep. Every time I took the medication, it sent me to sleep and I was able to get a good night's sleep. You go absolutely crazy when you haven't had sleep. Uh, so I was in uh, safe hands. Um, I, I never thought I'd willingly uh, admit myself into a psychiatric ward that can be quite disturbing places, but uh, I wouldn't have uh, made it on my own outside of the psychiatric nurse. The, the witches were having a um, powerful uh, effect on my life. And uh, so it was a real uh, miracle uh, that the night nurse uh, knew uh, that medication uh, for me and I was able to get up each night at 2 a.m. in the morning uh, when I couldn't get to sleep and go and get the medication off me off him. Um, it wasn't on my daily regimen of uh, tablets to take, but it uh, was uh, by request only. Uh, so if I came out and requested the medication, he was authorised to give it to me. Um, so I find... Uh, that uh, this story finds itself uh, in my miraculous uh, book uh, because it was uh, God's miraculous provision to have that night nurse here and uh, have have him uh, giving me uh, that medication. The next story. <coughs> is about a psychiatrist I had for years. Uh, all the time uh, when I go out, uh, I'm able to get words of knowledge, like supernatural information about people and about their character traits. And I'm able to walk up to a person and tell them uh, three things about their character and get their attention and prophesy over them. Um, and uh, I'm able to get details about their life and 
things that I've never told anyone and uh, really get people's attention. So I'm well versed in uh, doing that, like uh, like the person uh, shared with me that I'd been to the movie theatres and and uh, and rang my wife and stuff in uh, one of those first stories. Um, I'm able to get supernatural information like that. And um, I used to ask Jesus, why can't I uh, get supernatural information from my psychiatrist and prove to him that my voices are real, that uh, when I say that I hear from you, that I really do hear from you. And I wanted to uh, minister to my psychiatrist. And Jesus said uh, he's an atheist and he's got a right to be an atheist and I don't have to do a miracle uh, to uh, convert him. And uh, I was concerned because I liked him and I wanted to have an effect on him. And one time uh, for, for some months, um, Jesus really upset me and I stopped talking to Jesus and uh, I um, broke my relationship off with Jesus. I was upset and um, I went into my psychiatrist and he asked uh, the ordinary questions. Uh, how often has Jesus been speaking to you? Uh, how long do you talk to him? Um, uh, what's he been saying? And when he asked uh if Jesus has been talking to me, I said, no, he hasn't been. And he was shocked. And he said, how long since it's been since he talked to you? I said, two months. He said, you only seen me three months ago. Why isn't Jesus talking to you? I said, because he's a gentleman. I told him uh, I didn't want to talk, so he's not talking to me. And uh, he'd never heard of a schizophrenic uh, being able to turn their voice off like that. He'd never encountered a schizophrenic uh, who has voices be able to turn the voices off. And uh, it was uh, the miracle I was looking for. Um, uh, it uh, showed him in a clinical way uh, that um, that uh, Jesus was real to me and uh, there was something different about my case and uh, normal cases and uh, he um uh, after that event he 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 sort of wanted my Jesus voice to come back um when um I next talked to him three months later he was um happy to hear that Jesus was talking to me again and was uh really interested in what Jesus had to say um and um so I was able to uh get the miracle that I was looking for. Uh, to uh, impact him and have an effect on his life. And uh, Jesus uh, chose uh, to allow me to go through that situation where I wasn't talking to him uh, so I could be convincing uh, to uh, that guy and to that psychiatrist and, uh, and have an authentic story for him that I was... Uh, upset with Jesus and uh, I told Jesus to stop talking to me and uh, he'd uh, stopped talking to me and uh, it was authentic and uh, he understood it and uh, but he couldn't understand uh, how the voice had stopped and it was an enigma to him and uh, it really uh, got his attention uh, which uh, I was really happy with because in in a way, it uh, became a real witness to him. He was especially more interested in what Jesus had to say after he started uh, talking to me again uh, because uh, he knew that uh, that voice could stop at any time. I'm not saying, uh, I'm not suggesting you stop talking to Jesus uh, for any reason, um, and I'm not saying me stopping uh talking to Jesus was solely uh, for that reason. Um, I've uh, been hurt by Jesus before and uh, well felt hurt by Jesus before. Uh, Jesus doesn't do anything to hurt us, um, but uh, it's the way we perceive things. But I felt I'd been hurt by him and uh, withdrew from him for a certain while. But 
uh, God used it uh, in his foreknowledge and foresight uh, to witness uh, to this psychiatrist in a way that uh, only he could um, and a way that I didn't understand. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, that story. I was invited, uh, so this is the next story. Um, I was invited by a group called Schizophrenia Association. Um, they allowed uh, schizophrenics uh, to do uh, speeches uh, for people and organisations, and they used to uh, pay uh, me $50 an hour. So if I went somewhere for two hours, I'd get $100. And it was a good uh, kickback, but I liked I liked uh, speaking to people about my mental illness, and I was invited uh, with <clears throat> uh, four other, three other, um, there's four of us invited uh, to speak to a uh, uh, university with um, about twenty uh, different. Uh, people that were training to become um, drugstore users. Uh, I think the word you use is drugstore users. They're, they're training to be chemists. And um, I um, I gave them uh, some general information about my disability and explained myself to them uh, for about an hour. And uh, they had questions and stuff. And then... I reached to a stage uh, led by the Holy Spirit uh, to ask them, "Would would uh, I've got a special gift uh, that I use my voice for? Uh, do you want me to uh, show you an example of uh, how my voice speaks?" And they said yes. So there was five of them, and I said, "I'm going to uh, start with you, then I'm going to go round to you." And I'm going to share with each of you a special character trait about your life uh, that is really good. And uh, and my voice is going to tell me what character traits you have. And I said, uh, go ahead. And I did the first one, and the first person was impressed. I did the second, third, fourth one. When I got to the fifth one, they all asked me, and what's the trait for this person? And uh, they were looking forward to hearing what I had to say about this person because this person was one of their favourites. I said, this person uh, lives their life on the edge. They they try and test the boundaries and they they do things uh, that are outrageous. And they all laughed and they said, that's fantastic. I said, do you want me to go back again? Do you want me to start from number five and go to number one and do another character trait? And I said, sure. So I did that again and uh, really impressed. And they could tell that my voice was supernatural. They could tell that um, they weren't just talking about a clinical uh, mental illness, but they were dealing with someone who could tell supernatural things about them. And... Um, so uh, the the gift of word of knowledge is a supernatural ability, uh, ability to tell uh, good character traits a person has. And uh, I use my word of knowledge uh, gift in that way uh, many times uh, with strangers uh, when I prophesy on the streets uh, of my city. Uh, so they were impressed and years later, I was talking to a chemist in a drugstore and uh, I, I said, uh, what university did you go to? And he named the university where I did my speech. And I said, were you there when I came to university? He said, no, I wasn't there, but I heard about you. I heard about what you did. And uh, so he got around, there was a witness uh, to it and uh, I had an effect on people um so um that's the end of that story one day next story so one day i was uh uh in a really uh depressed mood uh and uh i'd uh i shared uh at the beginning in part one 
the four times that I'd been suicidal and uh, depression uh, can uh, get to a stage uh, where you're feeling suicidal. I was in a very dark place uh, this day and I was feeling suicidal and uh, psychiatrists can uh, tell uh, when you're really down. It's their job to tell when you're unwell. And I was in a position that I should have almost been in a psychiatric ward. And I was worried. <coughs> I was concerned that uh, if I spoke to my psychiatrist in that condition, uh, she'd uh, send me to a psychiatric ward. And I, I really uh, didn't want to go to one. And um, so um, I asked Jesus uh, what to do because Jesus is full of uh, good information. And uh, he said, um, just go and uh, give your psychiatrist a compliment. And uh, I said, that's the solution. He said, that's what I'm suggesting. So I got into the psychiatrist's office and she settled down and asked me how I was asked me the normal questions, was I talking to Jesus and how was my ministry going and how were my books going? And she'd taken the time to look up my website and she'd taken the time to look up my books and she understood what sort of books I was producing and um, <clears throat> used to ask me about the prophecies that I did. And I got to a point uh, where there was a break and I said, can I just share something with you? And she said, yeah. I said, in all the time, me coming in here saying I'm talking to saints from heaven and talking to angels and talking to Jesus, you never once have made me feel like it wasn't true. Um, I don't know if you fully believe what I'm saying, whether you believe I'm talking to saints from heaven or angels or Jesus, but you've never made me feel like you didn't believe. You've always made me feel that I was telling the truth and you've honoured my word and really uh, encouraged me and blessed me in in the way you listen to me. And um, the way you give feedback is really helpful and um, you've really uh, set me at peace in, in, my, um, in my mental illness and uh, you've been a really good doctor for me. And... Um, I went on and said a few more things that I can't remember. And um, she said to me, she said, I've been in clinical practice uh, for 20 years, uh, having hundreds of clients at a time. And no one ever has given me such a great compliment as what you just gave me. And she got emotional and, um, it was really good. Uh, it got my focus off myself and uh, I was encouraged to give the compliment. I'm very good at giving compliments. And uh, she was really impressed. She she said she'd never received such great feedback uh, in her life. And she's true. That was That's true to the sort of person she was. Uh, she's very honest and open and... Uh, it would have been true uh, that uh, it was the best compliment she'd ever received. She just never uh, had anyone with the observation skills that I had that's able to express themselves in the English language like I did. Um, I'm surprised she uh, hadn't had a compliment as good, but the way I voiced it and the way I put it together must have... Uh, really meant something to her. And um, so that was a way that uh, I uh, avoided hospital. And uh, <laughs> when I was in a place that could have ended me up in hospital uh, with uh, my depression and uh, I was really touched that uh, it was the best compliment. She could have just said that's nice or that um, that uh, really encouraged me. 
But for her to go on and say that was the best compliment she'd ever received since she's been practising as a psychiatrist really showed me how much it touched her and really showed me uh, that Jesus' solution for the day uh, was truly a solution uh, that uh, that uh, was uh, paying dividends. Um, one time, uh, so the next story, one time um, I uh, was in Social Security and um, Social Security is uh, where we get uh, our payments for disability support pension. Um, and I was on unemployment benefits at the time and uh, I saw a person uh, that was serving me and I said to him my frustration about filling out the forms and saying that I'm going for jobs uh, each uh, two weeks uh, when I had to register my form to get paid. I said, it's making me lie because uh, God has called me to work for him and do work for him. And I'm not really looking for these jobs. I'm just finding the names of employers and putting them down. But it's making me lie every two weeks and put this form in. And it's really annoying. I wish um, I could uh, get paid uh, for my depression that I suffer. And uh, she said, why haven't you uh, applied for disability pension? And I said, I was told I didn't qualify. She said, I'm the person who decides if you qualify. Uh, so um, here are the forms, fill out the forms and bring them in to me and I'll put it uh, through. Uh, so I did that. I bring in my forms and uh, they got to a point where I had to be interviewed by their clinical psychiatrist about uh, qualifying uh, for the disability pension under depression. And um, I was walking to Social Security. I was really happy because uh, getting a pension would mean I didn't have to bring my forms in every two weeks and I'd just always get paid for the rest of my life. And um, But I was really happy and I was joyful uh, that uh, it was coming to a conclusion. And I said to uh, the Lord Jesus uh, that um, I'm really happy and I'm not going to convince anyone I'm depressed. And Jesus said, just keep going to Social Security and by the time you get there, you'll be depressed. And so I trusted him because the Lord doesn't lie. And uh, as I uh, approached Social Security, I was about 50 metres from there, it's like this dark cloud descended over me and uh, it was real darkness came over me. And uh, when I was uh, in the interview, I just started crying. I was just so depressed and uh, I felt this uh, darkness uh, descend on me and I was just crying. And uh, the crying uh, during uh, the uh, interview was quite convincing uh, for the psychiatrist and the psychiatrist uh, passed my application um, and uh, I didn't find that out till later but um, it certainly did the interview well as I left social security I was walking away from the building and the darkness lifted off me and I was happy again I, I said um I'd written a screenplay where Jesus said, uh, said to write a part for myself to act. And I uh, had said to him that I'm not an actor. And uh, when I was walking away from social security, uh, Jesus said of my performance inside, he said, who said you're not an actor? And, uh, and it was true. Uh, I, the whole the whole uh, episode was like I was acting, like bringing on the tears myself. But uh, truly, when the darkness descended, uh, I went to a really dark place. So um, you may think that Satan uh, brings depression and darkness in the person's life, and he certainly does. Uh, but uh, Jesus has got a way of doing it too. And uh, 
and it's interesting to discern uh, 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 the difference between both of them. Um, so the next story is uh, I had a, a, a support worker who worked with me uh, to get uh, me from a boarding house into uh, stable accommodation with um, uh, uh, an agency that uh, rented houses and rented houses out cheap uh, for people uh, to uh, get on their feet. And it was like a halfway house, uh, which was a stage uh, to uh, be in that house for a while until you learn to cook and look after yourself and clean. And then uh, you were to go on uh, with an application for government housing and cheap housing. And uh, this uh, caseworker worked with me until um, it got to a stage where I applied for government housing when I applied for it and put my application in, had my interviews, I was rejected and uh, they rejected uh, my claim. And uh, the lady that was my caseworker worked with, uh, uh, knew someone in the department of housing who did the government housing. And she rang her up and she said, Matthew's been rejected and... Um, <clears throat> and a friend said, have Matthew appeal the decision. And she said, there's nothing's changed. Nothing in his circumstances has changed. There's no reason for the appeal. And uh, she said, just appeal it. So many people get depressed when they get rejected. They won't appeal. But if he appeals, he'll get it. Um, well, I went to the interview uh, to uh, have the appeal uh, seen. There was an interview uh, to uh, get the uh, position, get the apartment. And uh, when I went to the interview, I wept like God brought this darkness over me again. And I wept and it was uh, really convincing uh, to uh, the people interviewing me. There's nothing like uh, tears to convince people and uh, I cry quite often, uh, but um, when I was uh, applying for my disability pension and I wept when the darkness came over me, they were miraculous sort of tears. And uh, when I went for my government housing, uh, those tears were miraculous too. And uh, they uh, succeeded in uh, getting me my government housing. I've had my government housing for 17 years and it's been uh, really beneficial to me um, and uh, it's uh, really cheap rent it's uh, 110 Australian dollars a week uh, which is about 440 uh, a month and uh, that would be like 250 American per month. Uh, so it's really cheap rent. And you can imagine when I put it in your American figures, how cheap that rent is. And uh, it's a two bedroom apartment. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it was really cheap. Uh, so the next story is, uh, I was uh, <clears throat> I was working with these uh, strippers and uh, and prostitutes in King's Cross, and I was uh, reaching a stage where I was going to have an effect on one of the prostitutes' lives, and uh, there was going to be a significant event happen one day, and I was building up. Uh, to that significant event happening one day. I said before, uh, when um, you put your arm around a girl, uh, it can uh, discern a demonic spirit. And uh, there was a girl 
I did that too. And uh, she manifested a Jezebel spirit. And <clears throat> she uh, lived on the way to where this uh, strip joint was. And uh, she was across the road uh, looking at me. And uh, I thought uh, her knowing me uh, going to the strip joint was going to uh, destroy the plans I had that day. And uh, I was talking to Jesus that she's looking at me and Jesus said, she's not looking at you. She can't see you. And uh, when you've got a friendship with Jesus, you can talk back and forth to him and argue with him. I said, she's staring at me. She, her, her eyes are following me. And um, the Lord said, she can see four angels that are walking with you and you're in the middle and she can't see you. And she's interested in the angelic uh, beings that are walking with you. I said, I can't see them. And he said, you don't need to see them. But um, she can see them, and that's why she's following, uh, looking at them. And uh, so that was one time where I needed uh, to disappear, uh, where uh, God was doing a supernatural uh, miracle in my life, uh, having me disappear. The the actual uh, event uh, with uh, the uh, prostitute went okay that night, and uh, it was good that it wasn't disturbed and there was no foreknowledge of that happened. Um, I I was able to uh, <coughs> talk to the prostitute and get her to a stage where she was going to leave the brothel. Uh, so that was uh, really good. Uh, I'd heard of uh, Jesus uh, disappearing in the Bible. Uh, when they wanted to throw him off a cliff, he disappeared from within their midst. And I used to wonder how that happened. And uh, that uh, simply happened because uh, Jesus would be surrounded by angels and he'd just walk out uh, past everyone, uh, but they wouldn't see him. Um, and uh, so Jesus can uh, make you disappear. And uh, he did that uh, that day uh, with the angels. Uh, it's uh, really good uh, to have a life uh, where you understand the angelic and you mix with the angelic. I uh, worked... Uh, with this uh, guy uh, washing dishes and we did a shift uh, together and um, we uh, left um, the shift together and we're thinking of uh, uh, going out to a pub to have a couple of drinks and uh, we decided not to and uh, so I left and I went through these uh, turnstiles and went into the station and went down to my platform. Then I decided to come back and see if he was still there. And I came back and I looked for him on the other side of the turnstiles and he wasn't there. And uh, I thought he'd left. And he said he did the same thing. He left. Then he came back and looked for me. Um, and... Uh, he went on to go to a pub and he got a beer and uh, put some money in a poker machine, in a slot machine, and he won $500. Um, and uh, he wouldn't have played the slot machine if I had been with him. Uh, so I saw him the next day and he said, we worked out that we both came back and were looking for each other, but God had us. Uh, disappear from each other and uh, we worked out that the reason was uh, God wanted to supply his uh, family with the $500 uh, and uh, so <clears throat> in no way am I supporting um, gambling with slot machines um, but um, but it was very interesting that uh, God uh, made him disappear because 
Uh, if he had been with me, he wouldn't have won the $500. So it's interesting that uh, God allowed him to do that. Once once again, another encounter where uh, I've uh, been disappeared, where uh, God has allowed me uh, to disappear and not be seen. Um, so the next story is uh, I was uh, in uh, Brisbane and uh, it was afternoon uh, after work and uh, uh, I think I was driving taxis at that time but uh, I um, I had this uh, homeless uh, drunk uh, come up to me and asked me if I had any spare change. And I said, um, no, I haven't got any spare change. But I had $5 in my pocket, but I would have had to go to a shop to change the money because I needed $3 to get bread and milk at home. Um, but I could have gone to a shopkeeper and got him to change the money and given uh, the guy $2. But I said I hadn't had spare change. And as he left, he went behind me. <laughs> the Holy Spirit said to me, uh, like like a rod of thunder come through my mind, what you do to the least of my brethren, you do unto me. Uh, so I turned around and uh, he must have uh, gone behind a telephone uh telephone booth which was clear so I should have seen him on the other side but uh, I followed him uh, there and uh, there was no one for a hundred feet and uh, it was impossible that he could have disappeared um, so I knew something supernatural had happened Jesus said to me um, as I walked uh, home you judge that man, Matthew, I can't use you if uh, if you judge. Um, you thought he was a homeless drunk, and so it wasn't worth your time changing your money for him. But uh, you're going to have to change your attitude uh, when it comes to broken-hearted people if, if you want me to use you in the future. I, I got to um, a set of lights, I was waiting for a set of lights and the man came up and said, do you know where such and such street is? And I said, uh, you're lucky you asked the taxi driver. And I said, you go one, two, three, four, five sets of lights up this road and you take a left. You go one, two sets of lights and you take a left. And it's the second street on your right. He said, thanks. And he got $10 out and put it in my pocket. I said, I can't take that. He said, yes, you can. He pushed it into my pocket. And um, then as I crossed the road, I started crying because now I had $15 instead of uh, $5. And I had more than enough for bread and milk. And uh, I said, Jesus, what's going on? He said, if you look after my interests, I'll always look after yours. Um, and uh, so that was a very important lesson that I learned not to judge anyone. The, the first man uh, that was a homeless drunk that begged, I found out later, was Gabriel, the angel, the archangel. And uh, the second man that gave me the money was also an angel uh, that uh, had given me money uh, for directions. Uh, I've never, I've given hundreds of people directions in my life. I've never had anyone give me money uh, for directions. Uh, so I'm sure that the second uh, person was an angel. So in my life, I've uh, encountered many angels, uh, but uh, that uh, lesson about not judging people was an important lesson and uh, I needed to learn it that way. I don't think, <clears throat> I don't think I'd be the same as I am today uh, towards the brokenhearted, if that uh, encounter hadn't happened in my life, really uh, reinforced uh, uh, 
being in a position uh, to give uh, to the brokenhearted. I uh, had, next story, so I had an issue uh, with a woman who uh, had uh, manifested a Jezebel spirit um, <laughs> and she'd arranged for a spiritual hunt where people uh, tried to kill me uh, and my friends and uh, she was a dangerous individual and uh, I saw her at a Christian outreach one night and uh, was confronting her about it and the Christians there uh, took to her side and uh, were uh, trying to stop me from talking to her and the police came and the police told me to leave and I said I, I was pretty uh, forceful at that time. I said I, I'll, tell, I'll leave when Jesus tells me to leave. He said, you'll, t you'll leave now because I'm telling you this is the second time. You won't get another warning. I said, I'll leave when Jesus tells me to leave. And so both of the police grabbed me and uh, loaded me into a police van and uh, took me to another place in the city and uh, dropped me off. And they said, you're lucky you're not having charges. Now, don't go back to where that outreach is. Don't go back to that suburb. And uh, I um, I got out of uh, the police van and I started walking and I said, Jesus, where to? He said, back to that suburb. Um, I said, I can't go there. He said, what are you going to do? What I say or what man says? And so I said, fine. I was walking past a shop and um, there was a, a Coca-Cola outside of the shop on, on the ground and... Uh, I um I got it had condensation on the Coca Cola like it's just been bought and someone had placed it on the ground and um, I opened it and it fizzed like it was open so it hadn't been opened before and it was fresh cold out out of uh, the fridge and I know an angel had bought it for me or put it there uh, out of the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> just for me to have a Coke uh, on my way back to that suburb. I got to the suburb and I was quite nervous and I was walking towards the outreach and uh, the police that had arrested me were walking the other way um, and uh, I said to Jesus, I'm going to bump into him. Jesus said, turn around now and go to such and such a place where they have a homeless meal, they'll, they'll be serving the meal soon. So I turned around and walked the other way and the police didn't see me. And I went uh, to have a, a meal at this uh, hostel um, where they used to do outreach to homeless people. And uh, I went up there and had a meal. Um, <clears throat> but I want to highlight... Um, the uh, special coke is a special reward uh, for someone obeying me and uh, Coca-Cola is always a good refreshing drink to have uh, and I'm not condoning uh, drinking calories and uh, uh, drinking uh, things that are no good for you but uh, I certainly enjoyed that Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola was my favourite drink at the time and uh, still is and uh, I uh, get uh, uh, zero Coke uh, at the moment. Um, so I have Coke without sugar at the moment, but I still enjoy a Coke. When, new story, so when I was uh, had the witches covering my house, uh, there was higher level witches uh, coming uh, from New York and one uh, came from New York and uh, was in my house and uh, she introduced me to some important people and she said some important uh, people come to my house and one of the people that she had uh, come to my house was Hillary Clinton 
and uh, I knew uh, Hillary Clinton was a witch. And uh, I uh, was speaking to Hillary and her daughter, um, and uh, I was building a relationship with them, and I felt pretty important uh, talking to them. One day I was uh, in my bedroom laying on my bed, and they were standing next to my bed talking to me. And Hillary said to me, uh, why don't you come over to our place in America and uh, and we're just having lunch. And uh, so I translated over there in my mind. I, I went over there and Hillary was on the other side of the bench. I was on one side of the bench. She was on the other side cutting cherry tomatoes with a knife. And uh, I... Uh, I said to her, I said, you could try and run that knife through me, but it uh, it wouldn't work. You wouldn't get me. And Hillary went white as a ghost, which is always a sign for shock. And she went white as a ghost. And um, the vision was really clear. It was one of the clearest visions I ever had. And I realized that I was over there in the flesh, even though, my body was lying on my bed. I was over there in the flesh. And I was told later that uh, they had a cattle prodder and they were going to uh, shock my uh, flesh and uh, and sacrifice me. And, uh, and uh, I was able to get out of there. I, I, uh, when I told Hillary she could run the knife through me, uh, if she could try and she wouldn't succeed, she went white as a ghost, and then I disappeared. I left, and uh, Hillary failed at uh, killing me. She had an assignment uh, to have me killed, and she failed at that, and I never met her again. Uh, but uh, I developed a relationship with her, and uh, it makes you feel important, um, as anything of the devil does makes you feel important so it made me feel important next story um so i had uh witches uh visiting my house <coughs> and i shared this before i was uh teaching them uh the prophetic and uh teaching them how to prophesy and teaching them uh, things out of the Bible. I was uh, teaching Jesus parables and uh, teaching him different things. And they were standing there and listening to what I was sharing. I was uh, producing videos with teaching and uh, they were asking good questions. And I really thought that uh, they were growing as Christians. And uh, what I didn't know was uh, I was trying to convert them and they were trying to convert me um there was uh instances where uh one of the witches uh that i used to interact with that was my friend that she was uh the head witch of the coven uh she um she used to uh turn my mobile phone on uh to do uh put a youtube video on my phone at a certain time uh, just to let me know that she was watching, that she was there. Uh, so my phone would just be sitting uh, on my bench and uh, a YouTube video would start playing. And that was her saying, um, I'm here. And uh, I know three times I was in the shower and uh, she turned the uh, uh hot water off in the shower and the shower turned cold uh, so they're able to touch things in the physical and do things in the physical and like I explained before uh, the guy said that I could uh, turn my phone off and uh, and uh, go to sleep and as soon as I put my phone on the mantelpiece uh, he uh, turned the phone on and started to ring the phone. So uh, the witches uh, uh, decided uh, to send me insane and uh, Jesus had other ideas and I rang up 
I cycled and uh, admitted myself in the cycle ward. We had uh, the nurse in the cycle ward that uh, administered uh, the drugs to me uh, to have me uh, have the ability to sleep when the voices would drive me crazy. So um, that's the history. It's uh, it's a good thing uh, trying to. Uh, I had a good attitude trying to save witches, but uh, I took on uh, more than I could uh, chew. And uh, uh, it's very dubious uh, having a witch uh, decide to be a Christian, and I wouldn't uh, trust them. They're able to speak the Christian lingo and uh, convince you that they're a Christian and uh, they've got all the Christian terminology down pat and they can be really convincing uh, new soldiers for Christ, but uh, in the end they serve Satan and uh, they uh, have Satan's agenda and uh, they want to uh, disturb you and uh, distract you and uh, they wanted to uh, do me uh, injury. Um, so... Um, this is the end of part two, and I encourage you to like this or share this with your friends.